<laughs> okay. So, uh, Revelation is where we are, uh, studying the book of Revelation. And tonight we're at Revelation chapter 13. Revelation 13, and uh, just going to look at two verses tonight. Verses 1 and 2. And I'll read those out to you. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So that's all we're doing tonight, just those two verses. Um, because I think if you try and cram in loads and loads of verses, it's just like a bit overwhelming, the kind of imagery and everything. Uh, so as I've said before, there are many different interpretations to the book of Revelation, probably as many as there are chapters in the book, actually, and probably more. Um, so, but we have been following a specific interpretation, which is the traditional uh, Protestant interpretation, which is known as the historic orthodox approach. And some have found this a real blessing. They felt, yeah, now I feel like I'm finally understanding Revelation. Other people, uh, I think it's fair uh, to say, have sort of struggled with it, really. Um, so I've made a conscious effort to try as much as possible to simplify uh, what's being said, not overload people with in information. Um, but but and 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 this to me seems I think this seems the most plausible interpretation. So I'm just going to really stick with it, and then at least at least when you read the Book of Revelation, you'll have some sort of framework to work with. Because some people, what happens is some people just don't even read the book of Revelation, because like, well, I don't think I'll ever understand it. Um, so hopefully that will be, this will be helpful. So let's remind ourselves why Revelation was written. If you turn to Revelation chapter one, and just the very first verse, and it says, so Revelation one, verse one, the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. So firstly, <laughs> it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. He's giving it. He's giving it to his servants. Who are the servants of Jesus Christ? Christians. And when is all this stuff going to happen? Well, it's shortly going to come to pass. Now, we know that it extends you know, much beyond this point. But it starts happening right after uh, the the establishing of the New Testament church. That's so happening right after John is writing down this revelation. Um, so we've been kind of following um, a bit of a timeline, if that's the right word. And we know it starts uh, after this formation of the New Testament church. But here in Revelation chapter 13 we see the beginnings of something that is going to deeply affect the servants of christ is going to really really deeply affect christians around the world and that is the rise of the roman catholic church uh so let's just have a look at if you if you turn to romans chapter one all will make sense in a minute i think where's he going so romans chapter one Thomas, Thomas says, oh, when you start talking, everybody's like, oh, oh what's he talking about? He... But at the end, he puts it all together. So I'm hoping to be able to put it all together. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> so it's that's the whole the... way through. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just the last two minutes. Isn't it? <laughs> that only makes sense. So Romans chapter one and verse, where am I? Yes, verse seven. 
To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. So here we have a, a church in Rome that is clearly, and I think it is clear as you read on, these are clearly believers in Christ. Their faith is spoken of throughout the whole world because apart from anything else, Rome was the was the kind of pagan centre. And to have a Christian church there was really something. And of course, all the people trading with Rome would have all heard about this church that's right in the heart of you know, the centre of the most powerful empire in the world. And so I think there's no doubt that uh, we see a church of true believers here in Rome. But as the years go by, something happens. And what happens is the church of Rome starts to lose its way. And the leader of the church, and I'm not saying specifically this church that Paul's you know, talking to the or addressing the congregation of, but it is a, a church in Rome, I believe it was a Christian church, which starts to lose its way. And the leader of the church is lifted into a position of authority that is completely unbiblical. Um, and and the, the name, by the way, Pope, originally just meant Papa. It's like a you know, term of affection. But now it comes to mean something quite different. Um, now it comes to mean a man with great, great power and authority. And like, again, I'm not going to go into all the history of it because uh, I'm trying to really simplify it. But you can check out the history. Uh, the Pope tries to dominate the Eastern Orthodox Church. He tries to be like, you know, have them all under his control. That, there's a kind of big rift between the Eastern Orthodox Church and Roman Catholic Church, which is never really healed. Um, so, so, yes, again, trying to make it as simple as possible. The text that we're reading in uh, Revelation 13 says that a beast rises up out of the sea. And, a, and a, we've talked about this loads of times in the book of Revelation, that the sea is not like a body of water here. This is symbolic, right? The sea represents the sea of humanity. So it's like saying something or somebody is going to rise up in, in prominence out of the nations or out of a nation, if you like. So think of sea as like a sea of humanity, a sea of faces. And here's one person who's going to rise up or one thing that's going to, going to really stand out. Uh, so I believe the sea, the sea that it's talking about is specifically Europe. Uh, what is the beast? Well, I believe the beast is the papacy, the office of Pope. And it might shock you uh, to hear that. But actually, this is the historic Protestant view of Revelation. That That is what they believe. You know, a few different changes from one Bible commentator to another. But you can check it out yourself. It really is. Um, that's that's the standard view. Uh, now, to make it clear, this is not a rant against Catholics. Okay, I have nothing against Catholics. I definitely think that Catholics uh, can be Christians and can, be, can become Christians. Um, I don't hate Catholics. I don't wish them harm. And neither is everything that the Roman Catholic Church teaches wrong because, you know, they hold to the theology of the Trinity, which is common to all Orthodox Christian churches. But there are major problems with their with their church and with its claims, its doctrines and its practices. And many of these do definitely go against the word of God. And, that, and that's what we're going to look at really tonight. So let's deal with the symbolism uh, and it might become a little bit clearer. So um, in... The ver in verse one here, it says that the beast rises up out of the sea, having seven heads. Um, seven heads represent or symbolize the seven hills on which Rome sits. Now, we know this because 
Revelation 17, verse 9, it says, The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. So it's like seven hills, seven mountains. Uh, that That's the symbolism. Ten horns, remember I said number 10, represents uh, judgment, power. So the ten horn, again, horn is a symbol of power in the Bible. We've done this before. We looked at horns, at the horns of the altar and so on. Uh, horns represent power, and particularly in the Psalms, it talks about uh, the horn of my salvation and so on. Uh, but here the horns are representing this this power, particular power to bring judgment. And the ten crowns show that the power is being described as a power not just spiritual or religious, but a power which is also secular, like, like kings, yeah, secular and political as well. And the Roman Catholic Church eventually uh, will morph into something. So this is like going back before the Roman Catholic Church is properly established. It will morph into something that answers all those points. It will fit with that whole description. The church became, the Roman Catholic Church became so powerful that it dominated the whole of Europe. I mean, massively. Like kings and queens had to pay homage to it. And if you rejected the authority of the Pope, you start saying, no, it's not really for me. It's not my kind of uh, church. Or if you refused to go to uh, that church, you could be excommunicated. Um, and you might think, well, so what? You know, yeah, you're excommunicated. No problem. But what that meant was you couldn't buy anything or sell anything. More of that later in this chapter. But you would literally become a homeless beggar just because you wouldn't come under the authority um, of the Pope. Uh, if you disagreed with the teachings of the Church of Rome or if you did something that was against their rules, you could be arrested, you could be tortured and you could be killed. In, in the 1500s, later on, 1500s, uh, I think it's the figure is 300 Christians were killed in just three years in England. It's supposed to be like a Christian country. They were burned at the stake, uh, because and many of them because they had they were found to have a Bible in their own language. You know, it's like shocking, isn't it? But that is the history of the church, and um, so yeah, these these are are massive issues and things that the church needs to be forewarned of you know and that's why i believe in the book of revelation because they're going to affect such a large group of people and and remember we talked about how the center of the church moves from like jerusalem constantinople antioch alexandria the sort of center of christian thought and everything moves to northwest europe so much so that now some people think of Christianity as like a Western religion, where it's actually a Middle Eastern religion. But but so it's really important what's happening in Europe at this particular time. So verse two, uh, we'll read that. It says, uh, and the beast, which I saw, was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So here the, the beast, as, as it's called, is given what you might say uh, beast-like characteristics, like animal characteristics, isn't it? So we have like, you know, the stealth of a leopard, the strength and solidity, because it's like the feet of the bear and, and the ferocity of the lion. And these are used to describe the authority of Rome at this time. It's got all those characteristics. And at the end of verse, going back to the end of verse one, it says, upon his heads, this kind of beast that's pictured this, this, in this vision, is the name of blasphemy. Uh, and the, the Roman Catholic Church is most notable in the names or titles that it has given to its leader, the Pope. Now, just, just listen to these names and phrases the Roman Catholic Church has given to popes. And, and just how comfortably do they sit with you? Imagine, imagine I'm not a pope. Imagine you, someone gave 
title like this to me as the leader of the church. How how comfortable would you be with it? Holy Father. Holy Father. Jesus said, call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father, which is in heaven. Matthew 23, verse 9. So, like, Holy Father is like, I think of God the Father. He's holy. He's, he's our holy heavenly father. The vicar of Christ. Well, what does that what does that mean? According to Pope Pius XI, that title means I am God on the earth. So these are Roman Catholic writers writing about the Pope. OK, I am God on the earth. How about this one? King of heaven and of earth and of the lower regions. Um, hence, you, you may have seen pictures of this, the, the triple crown. Pope with a triple crown. Pope Leo the Thirteenth says, "We hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty." Now, no real Christian would dare to either take those sort of titles on themselves or apply it to their leaders because it's blasphemous. Because these are the titles that only apply to God. You know, the uniqueness of God or Christ. You know, you wouldn't apply those titles uh, or confer them on a man uh, and they become blasphemous if you apply those titles to a man so how could how could a church that had moved so far away from the teachings of the bible become just so powerful just kind of conquer all you know the 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 western world well the answer is in verse two and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority so who is the dragon well we've already covered this haven't we in revelation uh that satan is that uh that dragon uh on, and serpent sometimes calls him doesn't it uh, uh verse 9 of chapter 12 the great dragon was cast out that old serpent called the devil and satan so there's no doubt who the dragon is in this passage it's satan right and so um so the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority so his seat is his his position in the world his you know his his seat of power and this power is given to him by the devil um so so here's an interesting thing let's have a look at uh, matthew 4 Matthew 4. And this is the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. And, um, and you know how it goes, like Satan comes and tempts Jesus. And every time, um, every time Satan tempts him, Jesus says, it is written and uses the scripture to, um, to answer Satan, he doesn't, he, he doesn't get into a conversation with him or anything like that, just uses the scripture. And so in verse 8, it says, again, the devil taketh him unto an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, and saith unto him, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. And then Jesus said, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt Worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. So, so basically, Satan offers Jesus all this worldly power and glory, and Jesus says no. But in this case, I believe in the case of this church, which is going astray, the church says yes. Yes, we will have that worldly temporal glory and power they make that choice and i have to say i think whenever a church or a denomination or a leadership say yes to the temptation of you know money power um lording it over other people then in every case they're saying yes to the devil and, and they're not following the example of Christ. And recently, you know, 
it's been in the news. It's like there's no there's no debate now anymore that the organization of Hillsong has just been, you know, it's a, maybe not at the lower levels where people are just, you know, just trying to find a church and trying to do the right thing. But at the higher levels, you know, it's basically an international money-making business that's been exposed as that now. I think it's like once you say yes to that, to kind of this kind of temporal and adulation and you know worldly glory, you're saying yes to the devil, and he'll just you just invite him in there, you know. So it's quite important, I think, to see that that's really what what happened, and think just for a moment how dangerous it is to have a church that claims to be a Christian church but is in reality um, something quite different. Um, and now imagine that that church also has secular, political and military power as it, as it did at the beginning. Um, even the power to torture and put to death people who oppose it. That is a situation that is is quite terrifying, isn't it? You know, that is just, wow. That is incredible. And the early popes, like, who's it? I think it was Julius II, used to ride ahead of the army in full armour. <laughs> like, you know, it's, it's just hard to imagine. But imagine you're a Christian living at that time in Europe. You know, you're just under the heel. You're under the boot of that incredibly powerful organization and that is the situation that much of the world was in after uh, the beast arose from the sea